it's um yeah it's a little bit sort of chappy and daring doish this video is brought to you in association with the pima air and space museum please check out the links below to the incredible collection that they have out there in tucson arizona so the first of the few is a film that i am massively conflicted about because on one side i love it i have a very personal connection to it and on the other side it's got issues which we're going to get into but let's start at the beginning the first time i saw this film was when we moved over here from canada and my grandparents came over for a mammoth visit it felt like they would never leave and that was not a good thing at the time and now that they're both gone i wish it could have lasted longer but one of the things that we had was our old, one of our old tellies, VCR, ended up in my room and hooked my Commodore 64 up to it and things. And my grandmother bought me a stack of movies because that's what we used to do. We used to go around to her house, we'd go to the library, rent old movies. So we'd all watch westerns, we'd watch all kinds of things. I got to see, you know, Leave Her to Heaven in black and white, which was really weird when you finally see it in Technicolor. But that was all my gram. She had this love for film. One of the films she bought me was very much like that Leave Her to Heaven experience because it was this, Spitfire, starring Leslie Howard and David Niven. Now you'll notice on the box here, it's the other way around. It says David Niven and Leslie Howard because this is the Samuel Goldwyn cut. Now Sam Goldwyn had the contract for David Niven. He released him to come over to the UK to fight. Um, same as Leslie Howard. He turned his back on his contract, got out of it, came over here and started making propaganda type films for the British government. When the film, The Last of the Few, arrived in the States, Goldwyn didn't like it for a multitude of reasons. So he created Spitfire. Now we're going to come back to this in a minute because to understand it, we have to talk about the film. What is The Last of the Few Spitfire about? Well, it's about the Spitfire. And the story of R.J. Mitchell conjuring up this miracle weapon. So let's have a little recap about it. So if you haven't seen it, you can either go away and watch it now. It is fab. You can find it online. But let's just do a quick recap. So what you have is Leslie Howard's version of the story of Mitchell, R.J. Mitchell creating the Spitfire. And it's really a Howard film. It is him doing the whole thing. You've got David Niven playing an amalgam of different test pilots all thrown together. Now, when I saw this film, it is very strange because it is all over the place. The editing is nuts. And many years later, I was home ill from school and, or it could have been a Saturday afternoon on BBC Two, the good old days when there was lots of war movies on and there was this film, The First of the Few, which sounded oddly familiar. And as I watched it, it all dawned on me. This was edited to hell and was not the film that Leslie Howard intended. So let's talk about The First of the Few. It opens with Spitfires coming back after a sortie. They've lost one of their chaps. It's all a bit rum, but they've shot down a bunch of Germans. They have the most accommodating intelligence officer who's basically just writing down all their claims. Hello, buddy. How'd you get on? I got an ATA and had a crack at the door. Yeah. Good show, John. That's great. It's, um, yeah, it's a dull bit sort of chappy and daring doish. This CO is coming in a bit hot. He's a bit damaged. He crash lands, damages his ankle, and across. The field goes running. The station commander, Jeffrey Crisp, played by David Niven, pulls him out of his plane and the squadron leader says he doesn't need an ambulance. He needs another aircraft because there's hundreds of them up there. Yeah, it's, it's going to be like that. But anyways, the pilots all go to dispersal and they start talking about the spit. Spitfires, chaps. Just in case you've never seen one. Can't see a spit in the air without getting a kick out of it. Glad you like it, old boy. Can't help it. After all, it's my line. It's it's all very cliched and clipped. It's it, it's quite good fun. And all the pilots that are there are actual RAF pilots. You've got guys like Buddy Curran, Brian Kingcomb, who were aces. And they get called by their own names, which is sort of one of these weird moments of aces getting a, a lot of 
uh, <laughs> a lot of publicity. So for the, yeah, the sponsors of you there, the spits are Mark 5s, because this is 4142 that is being produced, uh, 501 Squadron, and it's, yeah, they're, they're, on, they're on rest, they're having a break, and they get roped into making this film. Interestingly, you'll notice a few sergeant pilots coming up being very differential to the officers, who then don't really show up again, because all the officers go to sit outside dispersal, and the sergeants are banished. Anyways. Chris starts telling them the story of Mitchell, and it's sort of weird, sort of, he just starts telling them the story. There's not sort of, can you tell us the story, sir? And off they go, and it goes back to 1922, when the Snyder Cup is won by Supermarine and Mitchell's Sea Line, which is powered by a Napier engine. There's a weird sort of thing where Chris shows up, and he's very catty. He's David Niven turning his performance up to 11 here. He's a bit of a philanderer. Um, the, the first date he brings home to the Mitchells is a married woman. That doesn't make it into the Spitfire cut, interestingly enough. Makes you think, doesn't it? Oh, mustn't think too much. Well, as my husband always says, he who flies and flies away lives to fly another day. Who said that? My husband. Didn't you know I was married, dear? No, congratulations. Oh, thank you. Oh, drinks. But things sort of jump forward a bit, and... You basically have this buddy act with Mitchell as visionary and Crisp as comic relief. Now, it's quite specifically set up for that because throughout the film, Mitchell is talking about what is needing to come. He, if you believe the film, kind of comes up with the modern modern plane fighter on his own. You know, this unbraced aircraft, which is ironic because the first racing plane he makes, the S4, which is unbraced, crashes because it's unbraced unless you believe the film and it's because Chris blacks out getting ahead of ourselves so the whole premise there is Mitchell as visionary and Chris as disciple the man who believes in his friend and this is important because the only person with an actual character arc in this entire film is David Niven because as things progress, as we go through the S series of aircraft, we have the S4, which crashes, we have the S5, which wins the Snyder Cup, and the 6 and the 6B, which retain it for Britain. Crisp is getting more serious as the film goes along. He starts understanding what his friend can see, and nobody else can, that there is something coming. Poor old kinkhead. How dare I go on with it? Calling it a life's work when all it does ultimately is to destroy life. No, no, shut up. Don't talk like that. I'm no prophet, but I know you hold a tremendous future in your hands. Something for England, for the whole world, maybe. And you can't pack up now. You can't stop whatever the cost. And that's what this film is all about. It's a very 1940s patriotic film because Mitchell works himself to death building the Spitfire and that is the key point. He's willing to sacrifice himself, even though he has a young family and a wife. What is more important is saving Britain. And working all the way through that cancer is him giving out his all so that his country and his family can be safe as part of the greater good. Sacrifice is the key there. And the film really just sort of builds on this, and it's not subtle at all. You know, they, they go to Italy and it's literally comedy Italians left, right and centre. Um, actually, my favourite part of the film. Um, <laughs> In the name of our great Duce, I offer you the welcome to this inspiring city of Venice. Silencio, everybody. Here is a telegram from the Duce. It is in English. In your honour, of course. Thank you. Welcome to our English friends. Bravo. Bravo. The sky of Venice will see the epic duel. The victory of the Italian pilots will see the dawn of the new fascist empire, Mussolini. You know, my friend, we have a say in Italy. Il duce ha sempre ragione. The duce is always right. And when he's so confident, that means we cannot lose. Welcome. It's brilliant. They're sort of plastic set Venice and things, but the aircraft that they've recreated and used in this are superb. The S-series flying boats are absolutely beautiful. Now, 
It's not without tragedy. You have the um, S6 crash where Sam Kincaid gets killed. That's included. You have the money issues. You got Lady Houston comes in, who's you know, determined to make sure that Britain is fierce again on land and sea. And it's Mitchell who convinces it, her that it needs to be in the air. Scream. Painfully patriotic. They say she sleeps covered with a Union Jack. <laughs> <laughs> Laugh. That's all they can do. Nobody seems to be worrying much about our country these days. Although I'm doing my best to make them. Yes, so I see. They won't believe me. But I can see something. I can see England in danger. So she writes the check. Never is it mentioned that she's a basically a closet fascist. We don't mention those sorts of things in these sorts of films. Now, the film ends with the Spitfires scrambling to intercept a raid. Um, the CO can't make it. He's still got his dodgy ankle. So Chris pulls on a life preserver, still a tie and everything, because, yeah, chap. And off they go. Um, they run into about 100 Heinkels and proceed to shoot most of them down. Um, Bunny Kern gets killed, which is funny because he survives the war and ended up living to a ripe old age. But Chris is, you know, I'm going to get the bastard. It doesn't say bastard, but that's the sort of thing. So he goes off and shoots down the 109 that kills Bunny Curran. There's a 109 coming up behind you. Look out, Bunny, he's right behind you. Bunny! I'm gonna get that swine if it's the last thing I do. And finds himself on his own as the controller calls them back, saying, yeah, come on home. Chris finds himself flying in the sky, slides canopy up, looks up to the beautiful clouds and sun and says, Mitch, we can't take the Spitfires, Mitch. They can't take them. Chris flies off into the sunset and it spits and stirring score, Churchill's the few quote, the end. Now, as I said, this is all really about sacrifice and it's very much of its time. You can look at, say, the 49th parallel in which all of Canada is willing to give up anything to, to fight the Germans. Um, kind of true, I suppose. Um, later on, you'll see it again in Brief Encounter when the two protagonists go back to their respected others rather than the true love that they find. Um, one of our aircraft is missing as well. We can see what our European allies in hiding are sacrificing. Therefore, we have to be willing to do the same. It's a very common theme. And Howard is turning this right the way up as well. And that's kind of the point of a patriotic war movie. But what you have here is, in my opinion, the foundation myth of the Spitfire. You have this idea of visionary designer, misunderstood, working himself to death for this aircraft that will save Britain. You stirred up a hornet's nest. They've really got cracking now. Past your design, everybody likes it enormously, but, well, I don't want to beat about the bush. With this plane of yours, you've got to get it ready in 12 months, because that's all the time we can give you. It'll be ready in eight months, because that's all the time I can give you. Now, when you talk to the majority of people about the Spitfire, that's kind of in the back of their mind. It may not be because they've seen The Last of the Few or Spitfire, but that's kind of what the Spitfire has become. The designer who killed himself to make sure that this thing was there ready to win the Battle of Britain. And I've fallen out with a couple of historians over this. It didn't win it. Probably was good to have it around, to be honest. But yeah, Hurricane, wonderful bit of kit. Also, yeah, designed by a genius. But that's where these sorts of things bubble up from. And, you know, if, if the truth doesn't sell, print a legend sort of thing. What you've got in Howard as Mitchell is what one would expect of a genius designer deferential, upper-class sort of chap. 
Mitchell was nothing of the sort. He'd worked his way up. Same as Cam at Hawkers. They'd both worked their way up from the shop floor. They were both not afraid of using industrial language. And when Supermarine decided to name the Spitfire the Spitfire, he called it a bloody silly name for an aircraft. Not like in the film where he's designing a funny sort of bird. But it isn't exactly a bird I'm creating, is it? At least it's a curious sort of bird. A bird that breathes fire and spits out death and destruction. A Spitfire bird. Yeah, no, not really. It's an odd sort of film. And it's one of those things that you can look at. And this is going to be a stretching analogy. In a bad way, you can look at how Gone with the Wind codified Last Cause narratives. In the same sort of way, Last of the Few did the same sort of thing for Spitfire. Because that's what it is. It, you know, it looks beautiful. It's an incredible Fleischer aircraft. But it's not this miracle weapon. It does happen to help that there's lots of it. And lots of people are going to disagree with me. And I can think of one historian who really will disagree with me. But it's, it's interesting because what happens when you take a film like this and you send it somewhere else? And this is what happens. Because when our friend old Sam Goldwyn gets it, he hates that his star is comic relief. He doesn't care that through the course of the film, Chris goes from CAD to gentleman officer, who's willing to do whatever he can for the cause. He wants to put Chris front and center. So a lot of the sort of more interesting bits with, you know, the, the married woman, the chatting up anything in a skirt, all of that sort of goes, it's chopped about, and it becomes a very different sort of movie. Now, the other thing that happens is this is Howard's second to last film because on the 1st of June 1943 he's flying back from Lisbon on a DC-3, a BOAC flight, 777, and he's shot down by the Luftwaffe. And there's all these conspiracy theories around the fact that the Luftwaffe went looking for him because they were patrolling further out in St. Biscay, all these sorts of things. It's all crap. See Chris Goss's bloody Biscay for that because he actually spoke to the pilots who shot him down and Oberloin and Herbert Heinz who was one of the pilots on the, the JU-88 from KG-40 recounts that on their return we were told that we had shot down a civilian aircraft with VIPs on board. I can still remember quite clearly that we were all rather angry particularly because no one had told us before that there was a scheduled flight between Lisbon and the UK. If they had it would have been an easy thing for us to escort the DC-3 to Bordeaux. And he goes on about how they thought they had a Churchill double on it. The theme of sacrifice with the director then being killed shortly afterwards is palatable in the history of this film. The other thing is when it comes out. So it gets its premiere in 1942, weeks after the Dieppe raid. And 1941 and 42 had not been good years. You can see what's happening in the East. You have, as I said, the Dieppe raid spectacularly going wrong. And then this film comes out. Of course, Howard's still alive for the premiere. He's, he's, he's killed a little bit later. But you have this very much of its time film with these elements around it that help to create an indelible legend. You know, we can see this in the same sort of films, in, you know, which we serve, 49th Parallel, which I've mentioned before. One of our aircraft is missing. All of these films have this same sort of theme running through this, this duty and sacrifice running through it. Now, as someone who has gone on podcasts to very much rage about the Spitfire, it has to be clear, I love the thing. It is an incredible aircraft. But it's not, yeah, it's not a magic wand. It's a point defense fighter. It did its job great in the Battle of Britain and it was stretched to do things that it really wasn't great at, which had lots of them. Go see the history rage for more on that. But what we do have in the first of the few is, I would say, one of the better war films to come out in wartime. And I put it on a par with one of our aircraft is missing or in which we serve. It is a very different film to them as it is bookended with the flying and the combat on either side, and it's very much a 1940s melodrama in the middle. Yeah, it's got Rosamund John on it, which is, I think, was part 
It must have been a lot. She was in basically everything in the 40s. So it's, you can place it almost perfectly. Think about watching Mrs. Miniver and that same idea, duty, sacrifice, willingness to give up what you have for the greater good. It's all there in it. So I will never get rid of this VHS. I think it's one of the few that I actually own now because my gram gave this to me and it's super important. What's even better is it's a dodgy VHS because it's recorded over something called Snow Beast. <laughs> so I love it even more that my grandmother brought me pirated videos in 1990. But go out and watch it. I'll put some links onto the IMDb and the other pages. I wrote a blog that this has mostly come from as well. Do check those out. The podcast, The Damcasters, is available for everybody to, to listen to on this channel as well. Please do like and subscribe. There's a Patreon page, three quid a month plus VAT helps basically pay for beer, really, which is nice. So we shall raise a glass now to Leslie Howard and David Niven for their wonderful portrayals of R.J. Mitchell and many, many test pilots that came afterwards. So until next time, thank you so much for watching and do take care of yourselves. Mm -hmm.